a powerful belief that first had voice in America and then in France, most recently on the streets of Tehran and in Arab countries, that says that free people everywhere ought to have a say in how they are governed. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies in particular, pardon my French, but that scares the hell out of the Ayatollahs. And increasingly, I fear the government in Iraq. To the degree, I'm not sure that they will want to settle this situation as soon as we would like. I'm afraid it could play out for political gain on the part of both of those nations. Uh, and in fact, if it does, we and the rest of the world owe protection and concern for the people of Camp Arshad. I think there are several things that must be done. First, of course, and you've heard it from virtually every speaker, we have to delist. The United States of America has to start with that. That's the catalyst for everything else that will take place, to include eventual relocation. Secondly, although I think it's very commendable that we have seen the UN and the EU issue mandates, I think they have to put teeth into what they're talking about here with the eventual arrival of either blue helmets or U.S. troops on deck to ensure the protection of these people in what is increasingly becoming a hostile environment. These people are just that. They are thinking, feeling, talented human beings. They need to be involved as a part of what's taking place. <laughs> Second topic. Now, I have to move quickly. Uh, I fear there was a collision on the horizon between us, the United States, and Iran over development of Iranian nuclear weapons. We have had a checkered past. We both have had miscalculations. But this development of nuclear weapons overshadows virtually everything else. The U.S. position is that nuclear weapons uh, by Iran are unacceptable. Uh, Iran has tried to mask it. They have said, well, we, we, we need to develop nuclear power. Uh, Iran has oil reserves equivalent to uh, that of the greatest nations on Earth. Uh, to say that they need to augment their petroleum with nuclear power is like saying that Eskimos need to invest in, in freezers. It is just not necessary. After Iran declares a nuclear capability, there are options there, but none of them are really very tasteful. Uh, we can blink and say that we will approach it from a diplomatic perspective, attempt containment, uh, but the fact is what that will likely result in uh, is simply an arms race in, in the Middle East, with Turkey and Saudi Arabia being the principal participants. We can attack, either in a limited fashion or in a full-out fashion. Limited attack on the analysis uh, of, of most involved will only delay. It will not eliminate the program. Full-out attack would be very difficult. Tehran is a long way from, from the beach. It is difficult to rain. And unfortunately, thousands of Iranians and, and, and U.S. troops and civilians uh, would die. There is perhaps a third good option, and that is uh, from within. In fact, it's, it's ironic, but the solution to both points I've talked to you about uh, have, uh, have, have commonality. The opportunity for the people of Ashraf to eventually go home the opportunity to avoid serious conflict between the U.S. and Iran, both could result from change from within to change out the Iraqi, the, excuse me, the Iranian regime. <laughs> there are storm clouds on the horizon, but they don't have to affect us. We need an Iran that does not seek nuclear weapons, that does not support international terrorism, and that does not kill its own citizens on its streets. Rather, one that encourages individual freedoms, provides representative government to its people, and seeks international and regional relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, we need an Iran that, if you listen to her closely, is the one that is envisioned by, the, by Madame Bajabi. Thank you very much.